So um, in this video, uh, what we'll do is cover the next four chapters of Rene Ganon's uh, Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times. Um, and these next four chapters are each on, uh, respectively, the qualitative and quantitative aspects of space, the qualitative and quantitative understandings of time, uh, the principle of individuation, and the spread and rise of uniformity in the West. And I think it's becoming clearer and clearer as I go through this what uh, Ganon is up to, which is essentially an attack on the Western metaphysical tradition, and by Western here I mean Northwestern, uh, the Faustian civilization. Um, I think we're going to need to bring in Gebser and Spengler and Heidegger and possibly McLuhan into this discussion to make sense out of what's going on because I think there's a certain sense in which Ganon is caricaturizing the West and his understanding of it as a caricature. He's not getting the essence of it uh, because the essence of it rubs him the wrong way anyway. So he wants to dismantle it, discredit it, and do away with it. So first, before getting into his ideas about space and time, um, I think it's worth discussing what the essence of the West is, I think. Uh, and no better individual did that than Oswald Spengler in The Decline of the West. <laughs> Spengler had a talent for going through and identifying what he called the central earth symbols of each of the nine great civilizations. Uh, for China, it was the Tao. Uh, for India, it was the world as dream. Um, for the Greeks, it was the body, of course. Everything had to do with the body. And you get the ontological metaphysical opposition of form versus matter. With the Arabian civilization, uh, which is the Judeo-Christian Islamic uh, civilization, the world is a cavern, and the primary opposition is substance attribute, not form and matter, but subst magical substances with magical attributes that lead to the development of things like alchemy, which is more or less an Arabian science. Uh, and then the Northern European West, the Faustian civilization, totally distinct, from the Greek and Roman civilization. This is the Faustian civilization where the primary symbol is infinite space. And that is what Ganon in these chapters is anathematizing. Um, the Faustian sense of infinite space is already there in the sense of the cathedrals. Uh, they're the, they've got the largest interiors in the world. Their vectors, when you walk into them, are straight upward. And you know when you walk into them that this is the civilization that's going to go to the moon. There's no question about that. But the precept, there's a whole new set of axioms and metaphysical presuppositions that come in here. And the ontology, by the way, the ontological scientific uh, dichotomy is now force and mass, which I think is a dichotomy that is conspicuous by its absence in Rene Ganon's list here of form being equivalent to form and matter being equivalent to substance and attribute. Uh, potency and act and so forth. Um, I think that uh, force and mass is something that, uh, which led to the development of things like the infinitesimal calculus and the motion of objects through space, through infinite space. The idea of a vanishing point on the horizon in perspectival painting, that vanishing point is the infinitesimal. It's exactly equivalent in calculus as it is in painting. And this is what the West discovered. This is the metaphysical understanding that the West originates here, long about 1400 AD, where it finally figures this out mathematically and prospectively. And we get Gebser's distinction. Uh, in Gene Gebser has a distinction between a, a pre-perspectival mentality in the arts, a perspectival mentality which comes in there uh, in the 15th century in the West d during the Renaissance, and the a-perspectival mentality which comes in with the French Impressionists who begin dismantling the three-dimensional uh, perspectival world of infinite space, which opens up here in a window with Masaccio uh, in 1436 or so, mastering already, bringing in this idea of a, a third dimension into the representation of the Trinity. And then it gets handed down and eventually it gets mastered by Leonardo. Uh, his Mona Lisa uh, is the first totally perspectively correct, aesthetically anyway, it may not be mathematically the first, but aesthetically he got it right there with Mona Lisa's the sort of muse of infinite space and you get this sense of expanse. Behind her everything has just dropped into a horizon of infinity. So indeed, uh, which Ganet says in this chapter is an absurdity, um, the space is indeed empty for the Northern European West. We've got this idea that comes in now uh, that space is not only infinite, but it's an empty container, and objects are contained within it. Um, now, so 
He has this idea of qualitative space versus quantitative space, and of course in his binary difference engine, qualitative is preferred uh, over quantitative. Uh, qualitative space for him now, uh, which he says is the proper understanding of space, is the, this idea that each object is a center um, and direction is the qualitative element in space and it radiates out from a center. The object is a pulsing center, like the cross, let's say, that has a series of radii that radiate out in all the different directions. And direction, then, is the qualitative aspect of space. So you got this idea that objects, basically, are creating their own spaces. This is a pre-modern, pre-perspectival understanding of space. It has nothing to do with modernity, and of course, deliberately so, in Ganon's sense. Whereas the qualitative or the quantitative understanding of space is the understanding of space as an empty vessel, which he says is an absurdity. How can you have empty space uh, with nothing in it or with objects in it? The objects to make and define the space, they add up, they make up space. Um, he doesn't seem to understand that the metaphysical presupposition for space in the Faustian West isn't an object uh, sending out radii from a stationary point, it's trapping. Uh, tracking the vector of an object as it moves through space on an infinite horizon. Once you remove the inertial conditions, you've got Aristotle, you know, this idea you could, I think Einstein, was it Einstein and Leopold in their wonderful book about the basics of physics talk about the Aristotelian conception of motion as a, always requiring something to push it. Think of a shopping cart. Uh, and once you let go of that shopping cart, then it comes to a halt. So what's making it come to a halt? Well, there's friction and there's resistance. Let's make the wheels better. Let's get rid of friction. It'll go farther. So you push it with the same amount of force, let it go. It goes farther. Okay, we'll push it again. We'll redesign the whole thing and we'll make it, uh, in a certain sense, uh, superconductive to the elimination of all force. So we what if we just eliminated all restrictions that the object had? Well, in that case, it would just go forever. It would just have an inertial tendency to sail off in a straight line to infinity. The ancients didn't have this idea, and neither does Ganon. Um, this idea terrifies him. This is the idea of infinite space in infinite motion. This is the Faustian genius at work here. This is why the Faustian civilization has conquered the planet, gone to the moon, has satellites in orbit, and why you're able to talk to your friends on your cell phone. It all came out of this presupposition of space as an empty vessel, what McLuhan called visual space, which comes in again with the Renaissance, and what Gebser calls perspectival space, um, that's Faustian. And that is what Ganon is anathematizing here. He thinks it's an absolute absurdity. So he dismisses the Kantian antinomies, and he says this is why you get the absurdity of the Kantian antinomies, where he raises the question, um, is space infinite? Does it keep on going, or does it have boundaries? Um, same thing with time. Was there a beginning to the universe, or is it infinite in time? And Ganon says these are absurdities because you can't have space is coextensive with the objects in it. Once it stops, there is no space beyond that point. He doesn't seem to be able to imagine this metaphysical Faustian presupposition of a space that goes on to infinity and that makes new metaphysical vectors possible, forces moving masses, infinitesimal calculi that, that make uh, physics possible and the, the arrival of the jet engine and the rocket. All that comes out of this. Uh, you change the metaphysical presuppositions of the civilization, and the axioms that get deducted from that make new things possible, events, new machines, new ideas, new things happen. Um, and the other antinomia about the infinity of time. Does time have a beginning or doesn't it? Well, according to Ganon, that's an absurdity because, of course, there was a beginning, and beyond that, there was nothing. And so he simply sides with one side of the antinomy that creates the enclosed cavern world. So it seems to me, interestingly, uh, he likes space to be bounded and he likes time to be bounded. That for him is qualitative space and time, uh, the kind of space and the kind of time that have the proper qualities associated with it. But notice that it's the cavern. It's the Arabian cavern that he's reactivated. He converted to Islam, went to live in Egypt, and he picked up the old Arabian prime earth symbol of the dome, the cavern. And this is the world that Gebser, in the first few pages of the ever-present origin, shows Petrarch already exploding as he ascends Mount Bontu, goes up to it, and he has this experience of this sublime communion with space. The world is a dome, 
is its days are numbered there from that point on, starting with Giotto bringing in the blue sky in the backgrounds of his paintings. The world as a gold enclosed dome begins to disintegrate and the blue sky comes in and pretty soon you've got vectors and mathematical perspe perspectivity. You've got the vertex coming in and all of that wonderful stuff that Western civilization is built on. Now I think here too, this misunderstanding or this caricaturization of the West leaks over into the other chapters where he talks about the principle of individuation. And he says, what is it that makes uh, the species, you have the species which is the essence, and you have the individual. The individual participates in the species. The, the species is the essence. The individual is, is pure quantity. Uh, but the West has chosen this idea of the quantitative individual. Um, it has taken the entity and rendered it simply as quantitative. Um, and that is the Western understanding, the quantitative understanding of the principle of individuation that he rejects here. All individuals have qualities. They are qualitatively determinable. They have essences. Uh, attached to them, and the West doesn't seem to understand that. So he says this leads to the idea in the chapter on uniformity that democracy is a uniform form of government. He's very anti-democratic here. Uh, the democracy is a uniform form of government that presupposes that everyone is politically equal. Education, uh, we have the spread of universal education, which presupposes that everyone is just this numerically equal quantitative unit that all have the same aptitudes. So they all, everyone gets the same education. Industry comes in with its machines, with their numerative quantitative parts, representing the pure principle of quantitivity and individuality as pure arithmetical units um, coming in with industry. Everyone is equal. So he's got this idea that uh, with the West and the spread and rise of the reign of quantity, it leads to this idea of uniformity and that everyone is just simply numerically the same. Certain aspects of this do remind me of Heidegger and his critique of the understanding of being as Vorhandenheit, which is the, the West's understanding of being in the late metaphysical age, which happens to coincide with the perspectival age, the age of the world picture, as Heidegger calls it, in which objects are deworlded. They are deworlded and they're plugged into a metaphysical Cartesian phase space with an XYZ uh, triple axis uh, set of vectors and they are pulled out of their contexts so that we can discover what their unique objective properties are. Um, and I think this is sort of what Gennes is re uh, rejecting here. The same thing Heidegger attacked is this idea of deworlding entities leads to shaving off their qualitative contextual differences, the things that make them unique, the things that make an object in the context of its setting, the jug with the wine in it on the table, uh, isn't a quantitative geometrical unit for Heidegger. It's, it's a jug that, that connects the human being with ritual and divine processes, and it connects the world and the horizons in the world to contextual determinations of topographical meanings. Uh, there was a theophany up on that hill at that tree. And so Heidegger rejects this idea of the self-sufficient understanding of being as for Heidegger, and also later the, un the understanding of being as technological and framing in which entities are simply stored up. They're simply viewed as potential resources for being stored up and held on demand for potential use at a future time. And I think Anand is rejecting, he's also sort of reacting to that same mentality that Heidegger's reacting, reacting to. But even so, even if we say that uh, the West has created this sort of uh, quantitative phase space in which it has deworlded entities and put them into a vectorial phase space of objectivity, it's not the case that they don't have qualities. It's not the case that they're just pure arithmetical units. They are not. They are put into that phase space so that we can discover what their objective unique properties are. We want to know what the unique properties of a thing is, and in order to do that, we've got to take a cross-sectional anatomical uh, Vitruvian man and stick it in there and see what its unique properties are then we write down what the objective qualities are. So it's, Ganon's even got it wrong here that the mathematical understanding, the way the West has treated entities in terms of plugging them into objective phase spaces, isn't entirely shearing them of their qualities. Same thing with Kant, I think, with Kant and his analysis of uh, the categories where he puts quantity and quality as two of the four categories, quantity, quality, relation, and modality which are the four categories that he has as the categories of the understanding, as Verstein, 
um, that presuppose any object that comes to us will come to us through the transcendental aesthetic of space and time. Um, it'll be in space in a certain way, coextensive with other objects in space, and in time, flowing through time. And uh, the object will be a transcendental object that will have quantity, and the subcategories of quantity are unity, plurality, totality. The subcategories of quality are reality, negation, uh, uh, reality, negation, limitation. The subcategories of relation are substance accident, cause effect, and reciprocity. And then we have the subcategories of modality, which have to do with possibility and necessity and so forth. Um, but any object that comes to us uh, will be this sort of transcendental scientific object X that will be subject to this grid of a priori categories of the understanding that it must be filtered through in order for us to not only understand it, but for it to become a possible scientific object. But even there, the object is still not completely divested of qualities. Kant has all these qualities that the object is going to take on as it comes to us through the transcendental aesthetic and the categories of the understanding. So even that kind of bare bones, x-ray transcendental object still has qualities. The other thing I want to point out with Ganon is his attribution to the West that individual human beings are simply shorn of all their qualities and are anatomic or arithmetical units. That isn't the case at all. <laughs> this is dead wrong. The West is based on taking the individual and transforming him or her into a species unto him or herself. And so this idea, and this is unique to Western Faustian civilization, uh, that the individual is is a cosmos, uh, a metaphysical microcosm unto him or herself that is totally different, totally unique, and with all kinds of strange and unique qualities that eventually have to be psychoanalyzed, and this leads to the invention of psychoanalysis as the tool for understanding uh, all of these incredible qualities that these individuals have. They are not arithmetical units. That's wrong. Uh, Ganon is deliberately caricaturizing the West and saying that the West understands individuals simply as arithmetical units without properties or qualities. That's dead wrong. That's not even right in the scientific understanding of individuals uh, plugged into objective phase spaces. They still have qualities. So he's really caricaturizing the West, and he's very much against modernity, and he wants to go back to the Arabian dome world where everything is closed off, into a neat, controllable system uh, that is non-threatening. Motion is eliminated. Evolution is eliminated. All of this stuff. His idea of time, by the way, I've skipped over uh, the difference between qualitative and quantitative time for him. Uh, quantitative time, he imagines, he says mathematicians draw this idea of quantitative time as just this line because it represents this constant coming up of the present and then the present going behind you, so it's past, present, future. Uh, he says that's wrong. Time is really circular. But of course, circular time is what Gene Gebser called the type of time that is understood in the mythical consciousness structure, whereas the magical consciousness structure, uh, space and time are spaceless and timeless. Uh, once you get to the mythical consciousness structure with the rise of the Bronze Age high civilizations, where time can be mathematically mapped out, then you have this idea of time as circular. Time is always, it run, every, in myths, as Willem Flusser says, myths run around in circles. Uh, and then in the mental consciousness structure, you get this idea of time as something linear and triadic, past, present, future, that cuts the circle of the Ouroboros of time and opens it up and unleashes the possibility of infinite time. So uh, for him, quantitative time as this infinite line is bad. And for him, qualitative time is circular. And not only that, but as the, t as the circle goes, uh, the time, the, the qualities that time takes on speed up. It takes on an acceleration because in the model of the Hindu Mahayugas, um, the Kali Yuga is the fastest. It's 432,000 years. The Yuga before that is twice that, is twice as long. And before that is three times as long. And the first one is four times as long. So it goes down four, three, two, one, uh, and adds up to 10 and gives you the sense of the human number having this nice neat number, the 10. Um, but that time ex it, it accelerates as it declines through these epochs. Of course, um, this model also has to do with the seasons. Uh, it's modeled after the seasons. The problem is this doesn't apply to the seasons. Time doesn't move any faster in winter than it does in spring or summer. It only does so in the Hindu model 
because the Hindu model is based on declining mathematical uh, magnitudes. And so, uh, but this is what he's privileging. He's got a metaphysical bivalent ontology in which things that are qualitative have to do with things that are in the past, things that are quantitative have to do with modernity, which he absolutely rejects, and he wants to go uh, and live in his cave somewhere. So we'll continue with uh, Ganon from that one.